we're all here to discuss what if you could live to 150. Uh, just to set this up briefly, scientific adv advances have made it possible um, for people born today to live to 150. I, I'm, we're going to discuss whether or not <clears throat> that's really true. And of course, that raises some, some questions. What will a meaningful life look like? What stresses does this create for our existing systems and institutions? And how will business and society at large handle those stresses? This is a very hypothetical conversation. We're going to start by exploring the science just to lay the groundwork. And then we will talk a lot about the implications. Uh, let me start by introducing our panelists and asking them to talk about their specific interests on, uh, in this topic, why, why they're here with us. I'm going to start with Simone Schurle, who sits in the middle. Uh, she's an assistant professor for responsive biomedical systems at the, ins well, I guess I just got that wrong, didn't I? At the Responsive Biomedical Systems Laboratory at the Institute of Translational Medicine and you're a Bronco Weiss fellow at ETZ Zurich, and you're also one of the forum's young scientists. Will you tell us why you're here on this panel? Uh, thank you, Amy. Yeah, so um, my research is on responsive biomedical systems. So in my lab, we design micro and nanoscale systems that we can apply in, bi um, in biomedicine, basically for diagnostics and therapy. And so it's kind of supporting a shift of medicine to become more proactive and personalized. And that, of course, directly will impact um, how long we live, how healthy we live. Um, and so that's why um, that's, of course, its impact on, on longevity and why I'm here on the panel. Great. And next to you on the far side is Bob Kane, the CEO and founder of Lunar DNA, Luna DNA. Sorry, Bob. Um, and you're also one of the... Technology pioneers. You're a technology pioneer for the forum. So why are you here on the panel today? So I have to say I'm not exactly an expert on aging, but I have a unique perspective and a lot of experience. Uh, it's a topic that I've thought about, especially when we think about quality of life for many years. And that's important because, you know, as we live longer, we don't want to add years really to the end of our lives. We want to add years to the middle of our lives. We want to ensure that we get those years when we're more vibrant and active and, and possibly we'll have to be working during those years to support the uh, number of people, you know, the populations at the time. But additionally, I've spent 30 years in genomics, uh, 15 of those years at Illumina, and started a company after I left Illumina called Luna DNA, where the idea is to bring together health, genomic, social determinant data in order to drive discoveries that help us understand how to improve our quality of life and how to live longer. And lastly, I'd like to say that uh, I started a rock climbing gym business while I was at Illumina, and really that was around quality of life because we need to stay active and rock climbing allows you to be flexible, it, it brings in your core, it helps you with problem solving and the way we set it up, there's a community there and so when we think about that business, we think a lot about improving our quality of life and maintaining a long quality of life as we get older. Good, good points. <laughs> um, and finally, next to me is Jerry Mueller a professor of history at the Catholic University of America. Jerry, why are you here on this panel? Well, I've written a number of books on the history of capitalism, and I've taught a number of courses over the years on the, the interactions between the family and the market, and the way in which changes in the capitalist market have change the shape of the family and the way in which what goes on in the family affects people's uh, achievement and so on in the market. And one of the projects I'm currently working on is a book-length project on thinking transgenerationally in a personal sense. It's called Planned Grandparenthood. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the set of interests that brought me here. Terrific. And I should actually introduce myself. I'm, I'm Amy Bernstein and I'm the editor of Harvard Business Review. And of all the panelists, I know the least about 
this topic, and I have tremendous interest, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Let's start with the science, and I'm, I'm looking at you, Simone. Tell us what is going on. What, what do we know? What, what's happening that will enable us to live to 150? Um, well, so we, we know that aging is the primary factor, the primary risk factor to the major human pathologies, including diabetes, cancer, um, cardiovascular, and new de degenerative diseases. And uh, we are at a state um, in science where we basically try to tackle the, these um, uh, death-leading diseases from, I would say, three directions. So there's the basic science on basically of a, of a healthy living, of um, more knowledge on healthy nutrition that make us live longer. We know exercise is good for you, sleep well, eat well, and exercise. Then there's another strand that's going to have a, a stronger impact in terms of how much this will really increase our life expect expectancy. And this is where new technology is coming in in medicine, which I'm also working on. So new ways of uh, monitoring our health status to basically shift medicine to be more proactive, as I mentioned, to kind of be able to, and so to give an example with nanosensor technology I'm working on, basically unobtrusive systems that can roam through the body to detect if there's already an onset of a disease early on so we can basically interact before, um, it's, um, before you have symptoms and before um, a disease actually develops. So this is kind of a shift of more preventing and keeping us healthy. And then there's a, a whole strand of um, a basic area of research that's really on aging itself because aging is the root of the source of all these causes of, um, as I said, the primary risk factor for developing these, um, these um, diseases. So in, instead of working on the diseases, working on actually controlling aging. And what we do know now is that um, at least the rate of aging, it's, um, at, it's, it's basically controlled uh, through genetic pathways. This is what we know, as well as through biochemical processes. And what has, um, there was a huge um, increase basically in, in the knowledge, thanks also to advances in, in um, genetic engineering with, um, with CRISPR, as we can now modify um, organisms to basically study these effects, for example, in genetic pathways. So a model organism that is commonly used um, in aging research is uh, worms, the elegans. There are also other, uh, like fruit, you can work also with fruit flies or yeast, basically short-living organisms, so because <laughs> then you can do the research a bit faster. Um, and, um, and so with that, we can basically um, test all these hypotheses on genetic pathways, knock out a gene, and then see how it impacts um, actually the life of, of uh, um, of, that species, of that organism you're looking at. Um, yeah, so I guess my question is, can we live to be, a, can <laughs> the people in this room live to be 150? R right now, uh, the people here, I, I, from my perspective and the knowledge I think we have right now, no. But um, um, I mean, if you look at, for the, for the past century, uh, we basically managed to double the life expectancy. So. Mm -hmm. Um, in, for the U.S. population in 1900, life expectancy was around 47, and it's now around 80 right now. And so, um, and I think this showed us just a, uh, um, and this was because we managed um, infectious diseases, um, um, and and now with, uh, we did huge leaps in, um, in 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 cancer, which was then the next kind of um, uh, big disease to treat. Mm -hmm. um, of of course, still. Um, um, still lots of um, to tackle to tackle here, but I think these are this just shows us how much has happened already in a century and as we know that science and progress is just accelerating of course the forecast looks even more uh, promising what we what we can achieve current forecasts are to kind of again for the u s population some statistics of kind of predicting by uh, two thousand fifty it 's going to be, be uh, reaching ninety five mm -hmm. but I think it 's hard to predict because a lot of the aging research and where we know more about uh, the genetic path where we learn more about genetic pathways there can come some surprises unexpected big jumps that we could make um, okay Bob so you 're an expert in, in genetics what what do you what do you have to add I expect <coughs> And that someday we'll have people who reach 150. I don't expect to reach that age. Because I'm, I'm 912 right now. So. I try. Yeah. <laughs> the way I think about it, though, is uh, biology is very complicated. In addition, I think that uh, our decisions we make in our environment play a bigger role today for many of us than our biology, whether it's our microbiome or our genome. So, for instance, uh, smoking and lung cancer used to be the biggest cause of mortality 30 or 40 years ago. Today, it's probably diabetes in the United States. Mm. 
And so the decisions we make, as uh, was mentioned earlier, around our diet and exercise are going to have the biggest impact for most people. Additionally, what I know in terms of genomics is there are certain genes that have an impact on aging. Also, there's, um, there's a chemical, I can get into one specific area that I know of, there's a chemical called NAD that's made in the nucleus of the cells. And it was found that that chemical is made less and less as we get older, as we get past 30. And that chemical um, relates to inflammation and uh, cell repair. And so there's a lot of work going on trying to increase the NAD in our cells. It's not as easy as we think because it's in the nucleus and you can't simply take NAD. It won't get to the nucleus. But there are many promising efforts going on to try to work within the biological pathway to increase the NAD. And there's a lot of great experimentation that's occurred that shows that with increased NAD levels, we actually have some reverses in aging. All right. I, I I just want to shift directions a little bit and ask a fundamental question. Why is this idea of extending life even desirable, Bob? I'm not Bob, I'm sorry, Jerry. I'm looking at Jerry and saying Bob. So I think uh, in many ways, the idea of living to 120 or 130 or 150 seems to me to be highly undesirable. Mm -hmm. Indeed, a kind of um, nightmare scenario in terms of how people think about their lives and the things in their lives that give meaning and purpose to their lives. Uh, the late German sociologist, uh, Rolf Dahrendorf, talked about the fact that in a, in a healthy society, people have a balance between opportunities and linkages. So choice, opportunities to you know, pursue professional careers, uh, social mobility, and so on, but also linkages. That is, what are the bonds that connect us to others and that for most people actually give the most meaning to their lives? And although some people do leave their mark in the world through various forms of creativity, be it entrepreneurial creativity or scientific innovation or artistic creativity. For most people, they leave their mark in the world by have one of the main ways, at least, in which they make their mark in the world is by having children and nurturing them. And if all goes well, having descendants after that, that is becoming grandparents. So, their li if you conceive of your life as not just a, a segment that begins with your life and ends at death, but as part of a larger narrative that you're descended from someone and you are going to produce descendants in the future, that creates a way of thinking about the whole shape of your life and about the possibility of human renewal uh, across generations. So the notion of extending our lives to 150 seems to be based on the tacit assumption that more is always better. Mm -hmm. And the death is a kind of defeat, but it's not. Uh, and if you think about your death as something that is going to happen, it helps you to think about what shape you want your life to have. So the joke, you don't have to live longer and longer to do more and more. There are certain periods of life when you're preparing for adult tasks. There are certain periods of life when you're conducting those adult tasks. And there's a later period of life when, if all goes well, you're gaining some pleasure from what you've accomplished in that middle stage. But the notion of pushing life longer and longer and focusing our attention uh, so purely on health and fitness um, means you're sort, of go you're sort of governed by Fitbit. Uh, and I don't think that notion is a very healthy one. In addition to that, I think the, uh, there's other negative implications of this in terms of uh, human creativity and so on. But by and large, I, I, I think you know, I'm all in favor of medicine and I'm all in favor of public health and the things that have helped us to live longer. But uh, the notion that we should devote so much of our resources and so much of our attention to living indefinitely seems to me to be perhaps misplaced. Bob, you've given a lot of thought about what makes life meaningful. So talk, talk a little about that. Yeah, so generally, <clears throat> generally I agree, but I don't think the problems are inherent in aging. I think they're problems we just have not faced historically. 
and coming from genetics and genomics, maybe I can think of it in a different way. I look at Darwinian evolution, and we have evolved as a species to deal with different stresses in our lives, stressors, whether they're physical, emotional, spiritual, or intellectual. And if you take those away, we start to deteriorate. And so, you know, talking about sort of your, <coughs> your physicality is a good example, but it also has to do with emotional and spiritual. If we don't have a purpose in life, you know, sometimes life loses its meaning. And so we need to now develop new purposes in life as we age longer. We need to find things we're passionate about, for instance, and, and be able to rise up, accept challenges, and go after those challenges, and hopefully create value and, and do it in a way that brings meaning and purpose to our life. We need to have intellectual challenges in our life. And so I think that there's this idea, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I think that's a challenge we just don't know how to address as a civilization. And it's a, a challenge that does cause a lot of issues today in terms of mental health, for instance, and in, any, and in other areas. But I think it's a challenge that we can address. And I think it does bring into question about how we raise our next generation of children to be prepared to address these challenges and others. So. Simone, well, you have some thoughts. I, <laughs> yeah, I kind of, um, I think I want to resist a little bit in the notion of um, A, so why would uh, our purpose, why do we have less, or so you think that the purpose is not enough for 150 years, the purpose we have now, or why does that change um, if we live longer? We all have now a purpose, and, um, and it would be just, we have more time for that purpose <laughs> to unfold. And then I think it's a lot depending on, so I'm, I would be excited to, uh, to live until I'm 150 um, under good conditions. And that's why I'm, I'm excited about my research and it keeps me pushing to basically enable us to, to live in a, um, um, to, to maintain um, a, a good health um, and, until late age. And I think it's almost, an, isn't this an, an intrinsic, um, desire of humankind. I think the imagination of uh, longevity and the elixir of eternal youth um, has been in, um, in history for, and, and I can refer to you, Jerry, for, forever with us, this kind of idea of it and, and fascination. So, so how, does, how do you make this, what is the meaning? What, and, uh, go ahead, Jerry, you have something to say, and I have a question for you. <laughs> well, so here's where I, here's where I, I disagree, Simone. Um, there are trade-offs in life and across lives and resources that are going to be devoted to keeping me alive to 150 are resources of time and money and energy and to some degree natural resources as well that are not going to be devoted to having children, having grandchildren, perhaps great-grandchildren uh, uh, so, uh, so there are, there are real trade-offs in terms of, as I say, of, of resources. And so it seems to me that in a sense, um, the, the desire to live to 150 is kind of, um, narcissistic. That is to say, uh, it, it places too much emphasis on us as individuals and less as us as part of some larger ongoing process including the familial process. But not, not confined to the familial process. What if you don't no. have kids? Right, right. So, so as I say, other people make connections in the world, make linkages in the world um, uh, through modes other than having children, obviously, uh, and clearly. Um, but for most people in the world, um, that is one of the most important ways of forming such bonds and linkages that uh, give some, that give meaning and significance and emotional warmth uh, and so on to their lives. And that entails transferring resources to them, including your time to take care of your children or maybe even your grandchildren to some degree, um, and also economic resources. So I think they're real trade-offs. There are, but I think on the other hand, we can have a discussion of whether we, we want to live longer or not. I think it's, it's anyways happening. I mean, we, ah, it's yes. already happening, so this yes. is just the other side, maybe, yes. of uh, the story. And we, we anyways have to get prepared now for how we deal with it, whether it's going to be 150 in, I don't know, how many decades from now, or, um, but it's the, it's the situation. We are experiencing the fastest uh, rates of, of age increase um, since 1960, as we're having right now. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, maybe we can also shift, because I guess we all have different aspects on and, and ideas of whether it's desirable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's happening. <laughs> it's, it's, happening. it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> yes, it's happening. <laughs> so, and it's not going to slow down. It's just going to speed up. Yeah. Well, OK. So Bob, you, you have some interesting thinking about the implications for child rearing, that we have to think about how we bring up our kids differently. Yeah, I think traditional education, for one thing, it's, it's a bit outdated. Um, and the education system doesn't evolve that quickly. Um, and then if we look at the exponential technologies that are introduced to our world today, the education system doesn't necessarily address how to be comfortable in a world with these technologies moving forward exponentially. And, and people are uncomfortable in this world as a result. And if we add on to this the fact that we're going to live longer, have multiple careers, and have to specialize in different things and, and be lifelong learners, then that adds more complexity. And so I guess I'll just quickly break it down into four aspects. And, and one is, is really wisdom. It has to do with the traditional foundation in education. Um, another one is well-being. We have to help our kids understand how to maintain their emotional and uh, spiritual well-being being, and develop resilience in their lives. Another is service. I think that we need a local and global perspective installed in our children and a belief in something greater than themselves and because that can help them with meaning and purpose in their life. And finally, communication and relationships. So our ability to communicate with each other, to connect with each other, and to work on teams to get things done is going to be critical for success in the future. Right. Okay. So you mentioned you know, we'll think about education, careers. Uh, Jerry, you, you, you have some thoughts about the implications for women and their careers if we live much longer. Right. So, uh, actually, the kinds of considerations that I have in mind are already highly relevant because, as Simone rightly said, um, on average, we're living a lot longer than in the past. Uh, Longevity has been going up to some degree since about 1800 and more since 1900, in part due to improvements in nutrition and public health. And actually, medicine has less to do with it those, than those larger things, but, uh, but now medicine too. Uh, and uh, now life expectation already in advanced industrial societies is uh, into the mid-80s and is certainly going to extend somewhat longer in, in the time to come. And I think in many ways, uh, we haven't, we haven't caught up with that in its relationship to the other most important thing that's been going on in the last 50 or 60 years, which is the movement of women into full-time work uh, and the increasing pattern in most societies of what we sometimes call assorted of marriage, that is people tending to marry someone of roughly the same uh, economic level, educational level, and so on. Uh, and it's created a life pattern where it, that in some ways is not conducive to human happiness if you think that having a family is, part of human, is an important part of human happiness for many people. Because if both the husband and wife have to get an education and then get higher education, I mean get advanced education, get professionally established, then they start, then they're well into their 30s, they start looking around for a partner, uh, they find a partner maybe, then they're into their later 30s, um, then they're into a period of declining fertility. So this has ramifications not just for women, but for men. And I think so many of our major institutions are structured on an outdated premise. That is, there's a, going to be a kind of gendered division of labor where the husband is going to be in the workforce full time, and the wife is going to be the homekeeper. That was the case for a while, from, the, from about 1800 to 1950, but it's, in it, uh, it's often not the case any longer. And to prove yourself in almost all professional fields, in law, in science, in scholarship, uh, uh, and so on, you have to do it mostly in your 20s and your early 30s, which is precisely the period when women are most capable of having children and when the men who also want to have children and who are married to them would be able to have children. So we have a situation now where there's a gap in most advanced industrial societies between the desired level of fertility among educated people 
and the attained level of fertility. That is, they have fewer children than they, than they would like, and sometimes um, no children at all. And I think we have to think about restructuring. There's no, in, since we're living longer and longer, and lots of us are going to be working 20 or 30 years from now, uh, you know, well into our 70s and maybe beyond, uh, there's no reason why people have to start the most active part of their professional life when they're 22 or 25. They could start when they're 35, and then they still have 35 or 40 years of work uh, and sort of human capital formation before them. So I think with the longevity that's already occurred and the increasing longevity that to some degree is certainly going to occur, we need to think more broadly about how institutions ought to adapt in terms of people's personal happiness, in terms of sort of wasted opportunities in business for making use of uh, of female um, intelligence and labor power, and in terms of public policy. I mean, in China and in many other industrial societies, as you know, the level of fertility is way below replacement. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but when it gets as low as it is in places like Japan and Korea and to some degree Germany and so on, um, then you have then you have problems arising, not just in terms of, you know, active workers supporting pensioners, uh, but a society that becomes older and older is in some ways um, less innovative and creative. And there are other problems involved too. So all of this then has public policy implications as well as implications for businesses and people's personal happiness. But let's go back to what you're saying about the implications for women. And I, I want to ask Samo how that hit her. No, I, um, I think that's a that's a very good, good that's a very important point, and you're absolutely right in this. I think um, um, I do believe though that be, if we are with the um, effects on longevity, that also probably the uh, fertility might so we might be able to basically also have kids later. So that also shifts then with that. Um, if we are actively really um, changing or controlling aging rate, if we come to that point that we actively are doing this um, on a cellular level. Um, but I think in terms of the, 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 the shifting basically um, the infrastructure, kind of the, the, um, um, the societal conditions we are now in, and then I support absolutely um, the idea we have to make changes in education as well in the, in the work system of what, um, how basically, um, what, what becomes accepted or what becomes possible or what we also kind of promote. Um, so I think that's a, an important step we already should take now. As I'm, I mean, I can only say in academia, it is, um, um, we have not, it's particular in, in, in STEM, in the STEM field, um, we're, not, we're not so many women, and the problem is to this career, or basically having family while, um, while being a faculty is, um, is still under current conditions um, hard to, uh, to combine, and so we need different, and different environments uh, where, where we can basically accommodate um, the needs of women for that. Bob. I wonder if living longer will bring opportunity to address this challenge. And so the way I think about it is if we have a society that's living to 150, there's going to be more than 100 years that individuals will have to spend in their career, which means that taking time off to uh, take long vacations, taking time off to raise a family is going to be a smaller and smaller proportion of our career. And I think it brings opportunity. Mm -hmm. Jerry, you're having a thought. <laughs> So we're already in a situation where people who are not that old, who are in their 60s, say, or 70s, uh, depend on not just not only their children, but their grandchildren to work the devices that they need for day-to-day -day life. What about when you're 130? Who are you going to call upon? Your, your great-great-grandchild? Um, doesn't sound like a very pleasant scenario. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's an there's a assumption running through a lot of what we're talking about today that um, that old age is going to move higher, it's going to kind of sort of move out as we get older. How's that going to happen? How are we going to have those, how are the middle years, you know, are, are the years from say 40 to 90 or 40 to 110 going to be healthy, productive years? Bob, I'm looking at you. Well, I, I think it's a combination of science, it's a combination of understanding how our decisions affect our lives. So I'm, I'm almost 60, and uh, I don't see myself slowing down at all. 
Uh -huh. um, and I'm hoping that with one day, you know, somebody else in my position 50 years from now will have science to help oh, we them have too. we have to talk, Bob. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily have science today, CRISPR technology or, or ability to increase NAD levels, but um, there are other resources at our um, at our hands that depend on the decisions we make and diet and exercise, family structures, things like that, and, and creating the right challenges in our life so that we can thrive. And mm -hmm. so the way I look at it is I don't think we're going to get to be 90 years old and in a nursing home and live another 40 years. I think what's going to happen is we're going to be in our 40s and, and a little wiser and a little bit more along in our career and then we're going to change careers and we're going to have another 30 years in a career and maybe change careers again and uh, we're going to get an opportunity to have maybe multiple lives in that middle portion of our life. All right, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open the floor to your questions. So you talk about multiple careers, but the fact of the matter is that we live in a culture that is infatuated with youth. How are we going to continue to create more opportunities for people as they get older? Because it is, if you are out of work and you're 55, in the United States at least, at least finding your next job is, it takes a miracle. So I'm wondering how we're going to shift values and attitudes. Yes, well, Simone. Well, I think um, I could envision, or I envision a, a model of where we, coming back to the lifelong learning, where we would basically um, have a system where we, we have an educational part, you, you work, you have another educational part, you work. So it's not, so you always, um, because right now it's then at, then at 50, it says, oh, what, well, what the person learned 30 years back is now not, um, um, it's outdated, so you, we basically keep updating um, continuously, and and to that extent, it just becomes normal that we shift careers. That is this kind of a, a just completely different model. I f I find it right now incredible that we kind of I mean we have education um, different systems. Some actually go leave high school and and have had educa lost education at 16, and then and then there's no uh, connection back to that, and you keep on working until retirement, and that's just these models will not be, um, I, th I think this will just not be sustainable at all. And I think it will help on many levels our society to keep on education as we live, uh, to handle actually technological progresses and, and be capable ourselves, of not asking our grandchildren how to deal with the technology, but basically to continuously keep, update, uh, keep updating the knowledge. Bob. And I think this isn't only a challenge of growing older. There are exponential technologies out today that are obsoleting jobs faster and faster and at an accelerated pace. And so you could go to school for a certain position and within a few years of leaving school, that type of job may long, no longer exist. And so we as a society have to understand uh, how to retrain ourselves and how to become lifelong learners in order to keep up with this pace of exponential technology. And I know a lot of people in different parts of the world want to slow down technology because it makes them more comfortable. But again, it's, it's not something we have control of. The technology will move faster. And, and that's completely separate from aging is going to cause us to have to understand how to retrain and adapt a new career. All right, I have so many questions, but I want to see what the audience has to say, yes, I think I see a question in the back. Is someone, yes, back there. There's a microphone walking over to you. Hi, um, I'm Ms. Ryan from, I'm an editor-in-chief of HuffPost Japan. Um, I have a question for Professor Mueller. Um, how does extending life um, affect inequality in the world because if someone gets rich, will they stay rich for 100 years or 200 years? Will be, we will be able to build a system that can, um, uh, for us to have second or third chances. How does uh, life extensively affect inequality? So look, very broadly speaking, in the history of capitalism, here's what happens. This, you already find this in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. Things that begin Think new innovations begin as luxuries. That is, they're expensive, they're available to a relative few. As time goes on, there's money to be made in making those luxuries cheaper and available 
to a larger and larger percentage of the population so that they become what are considered to be necessities, right? And Smith in The Wealth of Nations already makes the point in 1776, what, the, what many English people of his time considered to be day-to-day -day necessities were luxuries some generations ago. So think of if you have, perhaps one or two of you have a cell phone, right? Uh, 50 years ago, I think one or two, a few people in each country, the head of state perhaps, had a portable phone, and it was this big, mm -hmm. and a phone that, a device that had the computing power that is in your current cell phone, uh, uh, took, up, um, took up about the size of this stage at least, right, and cost over a million dollars. So this is one of many, many more recent examples of what starts as luxuries becoming available to more and more of the population. So I think that's going to be true inevitably with a lot of these improvements in health too. They're going to, the, the richer people are going to have access to them first, richer societies are going to have access to them first, but over time they will become cheaper and more widely available. Next question. Yes, I see a hand back there. Yes. Thank you. I'm Timothy Ma from Hong Kong. My mom is now aging 100 years old. Mm. And I'm worrying that I'm also having the same life as her. Why? Because I think internally, we are not well prepared for aging. And externally, the whole global world is also not preparing for the aging. So my question is how we can really prepare for the aging-friendly society not only on employment, further education, job opportunities, physical health, and even the finance model as well. So maybe our expertise can give us some advice. How we can well prepare for the age-friendly global world to come. Thoughts? I think that um, that's a tough question. I think that over time we'll have to start to um, change how we educate our children, to prepare our children. But for us ourselves, I think we're gonna have to realize that we have to make decisions differently. We're get, we have to move outside of our comfort zone and, and do things differently. And I guess uh, the way I think about it is, so we all look at our lives in two different ways. We all have this narrative about our life and how we would like it to be. And then we all have decisions we make on the experiences in front of us, the experiential self. And I think in order to prepare for aging, this sort of long-term narrative self that talks about preparing for aging is gonna have to more and more really control our decisions if we wanna be prepared. And we have to give up some things, whether it's desserts or, or whether it's taking five minutes every hour to walk around, things like that. And so I think that's part of it. I, I, you know, I don't want to minimize the medical impacts of aging today because they do exist and there are certain things we can't address and, and there are certain things that uh, many years will go by before we can uh, improve on. But I do think we still can make a lot of decisions in our daily life if we really want to prepare for being um, more fit and having a better sort of mental, physical, emotional quality of life when we're older. But we have to be willing to put aside sort of the experiential self a little bit and the daily decisions in order to um, have the discipline to prepare ourselves. Any other thoughts from our panelists? Well, I think that um, there's also from a technology side, um, there is really a lot in uh, development going on in, in basically, so for example, supporting um, elderly um, living independently through basically smart housing. Um, I think there's, so I, I, I think in, in all that there's also just this development coming on top of it too, which will help us to basically um, um, have a better, have a better, um, have a better life when, when we're getting old, to still be independent and, and can live at a home where it's just some um, basically digital supervision in a way. Um, and, and I think there's just from several directions um, improvements going on. It's, and, and again, I cannot say it often enough, um, these models of also later still keep on learning and um, have, you know, there are lots of um, uh, open lectures or basically courses that um, retired, um, re the retired population can take at university to basically keep on training yourself and um, I think this will, um, I think this outlook is more positive. <laughs> yes, uh, Jerry. I, I have two very disparate <laughs> thoughts. From a technological point of view, 
the thing that would improve aging the most right now is finding some kind of a cure for Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Because as our life has extended, as our lifespan has extended, as you know, a higher and higher percentage of people get these diseases that come with aging and that are in many ways the most sort of debilitating and negative aspects of aging. Um, I know a lot of people have been working on that, but it's quite striking that from what I've read and so on, there's actually been very little tangible progress on finding uh, a cure or alleviation of what is really in many ways the great health problem right now, I think, involved with aging. Second comment is entirely different. Um, I think you should think about the problem of aging when you're 20 and 22. And one of the things you should think about is, do I want to have a robot taking care of me? Or do I want to have people in my life who I have a close ongoing connection to, possibly because I've given birth to them, uh, and I've given birth, or I've, I've given birth to somebody who in turn has given birth to them, and who has, and who therefore have a sense of attachment to me, uh, and how am I going to get there as opposed to living with the robot, which is not quite the same thing. And let me just add that um, I agree. I didn't address uh, one the societal challenges, the economic challenges yeah. of aging, because I don't really have an answer for that. So I guess I, I, I moved on to other issues. And in terms of the mental health, I think a third of us are um, predicted to have a mental health, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, as we get older, and that's a major issue. Um, and in fact, I, you know, I'm not talking about it today because I'm not promoting uh, Luna DNA, but the company that I'm involved with is really focused on trying to work with people to gather the genomic, the health, the, um, the data about their lifestyle in order to try to unravel these problems. And, and so there's a lot of effort going into dealing with these very, very complex problems, and I'm hopeful that we'll start to make inroads in the next decade. Yeah, I want to make <laughs> one more point. That we, I think we should really not only think about the expansion of life expectancy, there's also an index for the healthy life expectancy. And that is, keeps increasing as well. And, that, and we have a whole, um, it complete, so I, I recommend to read uh, a book of um, Joe Coughling from the MIT um, Aging Lab, who, um, who describes the longevity economy and kind of what, ex what we're experiencing because also of this healthy life um, uh, expectancy increase, that we, we shouldn't think all, only about, yes, we're going to be um, be going to get older and it's going to be terrible because we're going to all be sick. We're all working. There's so much effort in basically making these years be as being healthy, so reducing the cost overall. Of course, it's costly first to get there, but then in the end there will be less, the idea is to have less healthcare burden because we are preventing, um, to, uh, we're preventing uh, the, the sickness. And, um, and right now, kind of in what we see a lot in what's going on in the six, when you're age 60, 65, people are fit, people are excited to explore, they travel, they're, there's a huge market that's um, kind of not, not as considered as it, as it should. It's actually a, a time where you don't have to work anymore currently. I mean, that will need to change to, to finance and support. Uh, that, but um, it's it's a time where all of a sudden, yeah, even new hobbies uh, get explored. My mom started to golf recently. She never did that. So this is now the time and kind of, um, I, I think this is just also a really a more positive outlook we should have on this topic. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more questions, yes. Oh, well, should we give someone else a chance? I just want to yeah. give a supplementary information. There will be a hub section on 1045 yes. about aged tech. That's what uh, process talking about robotic for elderly people. Mm -hmm. Okay. At, at hub E, yes. Hub E, okay. And there's someone down here who has a question. Down here. Someone can, okay. Thank you. So you, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, so you have talked a lot about the, uh, the middle years, trying to increase the quality of life during those middle years. From a hard science perspective, how much of the science that's um, helping us to prolong our lives is also trying to understand how to preserve, uh, I guess, the 
relative youth of our bodies. So yeah, that's exactly that um, strand of research where we're right now understanding more of um, basically that we can take control over the um, rate of aging, which would then allow us um, to basically slow down the process, which would then, if you take on early on, um, um, if there will be medications, I mean, currently aging is not um, defined as a disease, but uh, the WHO actually declared uh, just end of last year that aging is a condition that is treatable. And as soon, and there are, there's a huge um, uh, uh, kind of push from scientists in, in, the, in the aging research to, to, to define aging as a disease that is treatable. And when we come to that, medication will be, uh, so then the FDA can come in to basically go into medication approval because then it's a, it's a disease we can treat. But, and then moving to that, it will be basically, uh, and, and there's, there are any NAD trials uh, going on and there's kind of some opinions going in the direction that NAD would then be something to take as a statin um, at an age, you know, 40, 50, when kind of the um, uh, degeneration is, is kicking in more heavily to, to then uh, work against that. Yes, Jerry. Yes. I think this is really a perverse way of thinking about things. <laughs> Aging is not a disease. It may be useful in terms of getting government grants to define it as a disease. But if you actually think about aging as a disease, I think you have a real misconception of the nature of life. Aging, the aging of our bodies and the aging of our minds is a natural process. And the question is how we come to terms with it and how we shape our lives accordingly. So I can assure you that I have less mental capacity now than I did when I was Simone's age. Uh, and that, and my children have greater mental capacity now than I do, and that's fine. I have, I have less active intelligence, less fluid intelligence, but I do have some more accumulated wisdom and knowledge. These things balance themselves out over time. But the notion that we should, that aging is a disease, either our, our mental aging or our physical aging, um, I, I think leads one really to uh, misconceive the shape of one's own life and the shape transgenerationally. I mean, I see my grandchildren who are three and who are, who are six months old and three years old, they have amazing mental capacity, the amount of stuff they're learning all the time. And it's a fantastic thing to see. But, that's, but I appreciate that. I have gratitude for that, for that. I have a certain awe for that, in part because I'm not thinking all the time of, Jerry, how much slower are you in terms of thinking than you were when you were 35? I would add to that, though, that um, the pace of our understanding and the pace of technology is moving faster than evolution can keep up with. And so if we look at where evolution really is, it's back in the days where we would have children in a village, maybe. And once we had our children, you know, our role in society was to take care of our grandchildren, maybe, as they, basically the middle generation went out and did the hunting and gathering. And in that sense, we didn't need a lot of the facilities that we need today. And evolutionarily, a lot of our capabilities start to shut down so that we require less energy and we start to wither away and make room for future generations. And I think there's a good argument that that was a product of evolution and we have moved past that. And in order for us to really um, allow evolution to catch up, we have to force the changes ourselves. And so I don't think any of these um, areas where we um, lose capability are inherent. And I can go back to NAD as an example, as one example where evolutionarily we start to produce less and less of that. And interestingly enough, um, people with more NAD have a better ability to repair cells, for instance, to repair broken bones. It has to do with being sort of nearsighted and using reading glasses. Um, and it's shown that increasing NAD can reverse some of these effects. And you know, one last thought is, interestingly enough, you can increase NAD through diet, um, fasting, and caloric restriction, and through exercise. And so supplements aren't really required. But supplements can also be a big benefit, you know, the right ones, and we don't, we don't have those today. Jerry. 
Yeah, so I think that this idea that there is this uh, greater and greater gap between our biological, natural biological capabilities and the role of technology is in many ways um, not, is often sort of the opposite of the case. So I'm 65. I'm not as good as I was when I was 35 or 45 at remembering the names of books, mm -hmm. right? And I'm an academic, so it's important for me to be able to cite the names of books. But there's this technological development called Google. If I can remember some of the words in the title or one of the words, uh, one of the names of the authors, I put it in there and the technology compensates for my biological diminution. Yes, let's see. Yes, I see a question in the third row at the end, I think, second row. Hello, uh, my question is, uh, I'm from, uh, my name is Shivram, I'm from Bangalore. Uh, I wanted to know what is the probability of uh, figuring out a cure for aging in next 25 years, and if you want to do it, uh, how much resources do you need, like in the sense of money, like, uh, is it $1 billion, $10 billion, $1 trillion? How much do you need, and what is the probability of reaching there in the next 25 years? <laughs> I, th I think that's a very hard um, a question to answer, and I would rather like to refer you actually to a newly founded uh, Academy of Healthy Life and uh, Longevity, um, because there is so much, um, you, you can also use now Google <laughs> to, to, look f to look for answers, and you will find a lot that is just wrong, I'm sorry, because there's, um, um, there's a huge interest in public in longevity. And there's, um, um, of course, but there's also so much misconception, and it's hard to uh, differentiate between actually um, clear scientific evidence and just claims um, that have now foundation, no foundation. And so we rely also on, um, on basically centers where we know uh, when you look, when, when you go there and you, um, you what, what you look up there is actually, is actually correct. So in that sense, I would rather refer you to, to some of the leading uh, researchers in the, in the aging science that is really related to genetic reprogramming, NAD trials that are ongoing, and, and kind of all on the genetic and biochemical processes uh, where we're just at the, at the beginning of understanding um, how, how we can influence aging um, to, to find the answers. And I would add that um, if we do use um, disease as a model for aging, then what we call aging is really just a clinical bucket that a lot of different symptoms are lumped into, and it's really not one thing. It, it's many, many, many complex things. And so when we talk about a cure for aging, I think we'll start to, to check them off, and we are already. That's why we're living longer. And I don't think there's a sort of a panacea out there that's going to allow everybody to live longer. I think that we'll continue to check them off, and some findings and discoveries will be more beneficial than others. Jerry, and you have, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I mean, we are um, now at a state where we kind of identified um, some of the major hallmarks of aging, but the uh, um, complexity of the interplay of these different hallmarks, so we have also of course, epigenetic changes on yourself because of your environment, but there are then intrinsic genetic changes and so on. So there's just a lot that still needs to be um, un unlocked and to be seen. I just want to say, if you, if you meet somebody who can answer your question about how much it will cost to solve the problem of aging and how long it will take, hold on to your wallet. <laughs> so I'm just seeing if we have one more, yes, I see one more question right there, and this will be our last question. Thank you. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a split in the panel uh, <laughs> I'm detecting between Jerry and, and you other guys, and, and one, of the, one of the things that seems to split is the, the idea of uh, ageing being a natural process, right? And, and I, I, I'm interested in the idea, it may be natural, but does that mean it's desirable? And, and you know, it was natural in 1900 to die at 47. Is, is that good? You know? Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in whether that, that, that idea, and also, you know, it's similar, Jerry, you were talking about family at being the, the centre of, of everything. It seemed to be a strong th thing you were commenting on. You know, there are other ways to, to derive value and, and other linkages, right? So there may be, when we age 150, maybe the linkages will be different. And, and there are, so I'm just interested on the, the opinion of the panel of that, you know. Any thoughts? Well, I, ju I just want to say your, your fundamental premise is, is correct, that not everything that's natural is desirable. 
The question is whether there's something uh, morally desirable in, to some degree, living one's life in keeping with certain natural processes or whether we want to really live unnatural lives. So why shouldn't we all be cyborgs, right? And there are, of course, people around to advocate this. Uh, and so I think there's some, uh, I think you're right that not everything that's natural is desirable, uh, but one can go too far the other way and I think the trick is to find some sort of middle ground. I I, um, just also, what, what, is it, what does it mean when we say um, it's natural? I, I think it deals also with this, we don't know yet um, why this is happening, but at the moment we understand and we get control, and we can get control over it. Why would we not change? Because if the desire, and I would like to, maybe if we can, who, who doesn't want to live to 150 if you would have a high quality of life, you, you would um, look younger, um, or you would, would keep on looking young for a longer time, and overall be still active, and um, no new, no uh, basically good um, brain capacity or cognitive capacity, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to live until 150? I feel we even have the, the, the thought of, uh, of afterlife of, because we don't want to give up the idea of not living anymore, like, or some ha have the idea of afterlife. I mean, it's an, um, so this, I, I just feel it's, it, it's interesting that we're not, that there's so much um, opponing, um, or that's not moral to think of, if we can do it, why shouldn't we live longer at good conditions? Well, I'm afraid we're gonna have to draw to a close, and I think that's a great question to set our minds thinking. Uh, you know, what I'm taking away from this is that we need to think about how we think about aging. Um, is it a disease? Is it a natural process that we need to embrace? What needs to happen in our world in, in terms of not just science, but government policy in terms of business and all the other policy, uh, functions and institutions of our world to enable these healthy long lives. And then one question I have that I don't think we can answer tonight or today <laughs> um, is, is what we're talking about going to be a rich world phenomenon? So with that, I'm going to draw this to a close and thank you all and thank our panelists. Thank you.